When you look at the book Cadillac Hotel behind me, it doesn't look like much at first. Just another big abandoned building in a place like Detroit that's full of big abandoned buildings. But you have to ask yourself, if that's all it really is, then why would its redevelopment be covered in over 200 newspapers from around the globe, from New York to LA, from Seattle to Tallahassee? What would inspire so many newspapers to write so much about this old hotel? What is it about this place that would inspire a dedicated group of individuals with no political or financial stake in this hotel to donate a large portion of their lives to seeing it reopen? And more importantly, what does all of this mean to the people who live and work around here? Well, I think that the Book Cadillac Hotel is essentially the epitome of the rise and fall of Detroit. There are many abandoned buildings downtown Detroit, but there's yet to be one large-scale redevelopment project that has inspired the people. It'll be the first major project that is redeveloped in a historic fashion. There's not really very many buildings like it anywhere in the country. Only a few cities would have something that large and, and that exuberant with its mishmash of different architectural styles. It, it really shows that they're invested in rebuilding a city as opposed to trying to build a new one or trying to build a land that isn't reflective of, of, of what Detroit is. When we think about what it could be again and what it could represent in terms of bringing the city back, in terms of uh, representing uh, a real renaissance and uh, another major landmark property that we can get back online, um, you, you, you can't begin to, uh, to describe the importance of what the book Cadillac represents to the city and the citizens of the city of Detroit. A lot of history took place on that spot. And when people think about it, I think they can become excited about the environment that they're in. Once it's redeveloped, it'll be a model for large-scale redevelopment of 1920s skyscrapers. And if we can do it on this building, there's no building in southeastern Michigan that's now shuttered that can't be redeveloped. And that's the statement it'll make. When the Book Cadillac Hotel opened its doors in the 1920s, it was the place to be and be seen. The hotel was built by the Book Brothers, J.B. Herbert and Frank. They envisioned this stretch of Washington Boulevard as being the Fifth Avenue of the West, a place that was filled with the most glamorous of shops, hotels, and restaurants. The Book Cadillac at the southern end of Washington Boulevard, along with the Statler at the northern end, cemented this vision. It was designed by Lewis Camper. The hotel even housed a radio station on its top floor. The book Cadillac even became a movie star of sorts. It was featured in the 1948 Frank Capra classic, State of the Union, with Spencer Tracy, Katherine Hepburn, and Angela Lansbury. And the 1973 cult favorite, Detroit 9000. At the time, it was the tallest building in the state and the tallest hotel in the world. What impresses me most about the book Cadillac is the history of the hotel the elegance and glamour, the whole idea that the Book Brothers had of creating a fashionable boulevard in Detroit, one that would be comparable to Fifth Avenue in New York. I thought that was an incredible idea. I think the Book Cadillac itself represents a lot of the city of Detroit. It was built at a time when the average per capita income in Detroit was higher than anywhere else in the world, higher than New York, Paris, London. People in Detroit had more money on average than anywhere else in the world. And I think it's shown in a building like this. After the Statler went up and revolutionized uh, just the whole hotel industry, the book, the book building itself came up. You had the book building in this side of Washington. You had the whole Washington Boulevard, which was rightly so compared to Paris, the whole area. It was just fantastic. And then you have something like this comes up which is better than the Statler in many respects. And the Statler realized it and dropped the rates because you can't compete with a building that th is this beautiful. You look at the architecture, it's something we could never do again. Even with the money, people say it's too expensive. It's not that it's too expensive. We don't have people that can do that. You know, when it was built in 1924, it was the tallest hotel in the world. And it's, it's, it's regarded or it was regarded as one of the finest hotels in the world. And that has a lot of importance, not only to the region and the people of this region, but to people all over the place. What isn't special about the building? The building, um, as you can see, is, is huge. It was built um, 
as the largest, tallest hotel in the country. And to have that distinction in Detroit really speaks to how important Detroit was the first part of the um, 20th century. And when we talk about the book catalog and its importance to Detroit um, and its importance to uh, what was happening and what it represented, um, it just is so impressive to think that um, all of this, this resource and this activity and this life and vitality were happening here in the city of Detroit. I think the architecture of the hotel is strong yet civil, and I think that that projected an image that Detroit was at the time. It was a town that was cosmopolitan, it was a town that was strong, and when the hotel was built and put together, it reflected a lot of the city. And I think to this day, it reflects a lot of the trials and tribulations and rebirth of the city of Detroit. So I think that that's probably the, the most impressive piece of, uh, of the book Cadillac. The city of Detroit was founded when Antoine de la Mose, Sieur de Cadillac, landed here in July 1701. He came here to build a military post that would protect French trading routes in the area. When he landed, he was impressed by the area's strategic value. At a narrow point in the Detroit River and, and on a bank some 40 feet about the river itself, the site became known as Fort Pontchartrain de Detroit. Pontchartrain was King Louis of France's Minister of Marine. Detroit, or Detroit, means the Straits. Fort Pontchartrain of the Straits. It was from these early days that the city now known as Detroit was born. When the hotel was opened, they honored Detroit's heritage by incorporating the city's founder into its name. It's his family crest that adorns the book Cadillac Hotel and was used in their logo. As being an architect, as well as a Detroit historian and a uh, lecturer on the city, the book Cadillac, in a city of landmarks, is one of the most significant landmarks to the city, both in architecture as well as its significance to the city. Architecturally speaking, it's done in a nouveau or neo-Renaissance revival. As far as its design, it was designed by Lewis Camper, the architect, who did a significant portion of his career in Detroit. And it was built in 1924. And a lot of his techniques on that hotel, its uh, design layout, its proportions, he perfected on other previous jobs that he did in the early and mid-20s as well. But as far as its significance to the city as a landmark, I would say that every major important character in the history of the 20th century, as well as the city of Detroit, passed through its doors. The people who stayed here 70 or 80 years ago have long left this world. Some of the things they left behind serve as a reminder of their lives plates from the hotel's dining room, a soda spoon. My favorite, though, are some of the postcards that offer us not only an image to look at, but a little peek into someone's everyday life. Take this one, for example, sent back in September of 1927 to someone in California. My arrival in these parts is a sign for torrid heat to be turned on. I'm wondering if I can't capitalize on my powers and arrange freak weather in midwinter. Ever the busy businessman, the trip south, etc., but I'm having a good time anyway. Hope you are the same. Simple words on hotel stationery, but it reminds us of what life was like back then. Some of the other things on these cards are important too, like on this card from 1936. Like the fact that the rooms at the book Cadillac featured circulating ice water. That was an early form of air conditioning where cold water was piped through the radiators instead of steam. It was pretty sophisticated for its time. I'm interested in the book Cadillac as I'm interested in the history of the entire city of Detroit. When I moved into the city, I began studying the history of Detroit, especially the downtown area. It fascinated me, and I believe it enriched my life to learn about the city that I now live in. Well, I think postcards in general are pretty charming. Um, I started collecting them, and that's actually what piqued my interest in the city of Detroit. So I collected them on the buildings that were in Detroit and more importantly the buildings that still are in the city of Detroit and that includes the book Cadillac. The Detroit Publishing Company had a special process that died with that company. Most postcards were a four-color process whereas the Detroit Publishing Company or Photostint 
had more like a lithographic process in printing their cards. So their color postcards are beautiful. They're almost like oil paintings. So naturally I was delighted that I was not, able, not only able to find one of the exterior of the book catalog, but also interior shots. And interior shots of any building are far more rare than are the exteriors. Well, as I was saying before about the uh, history of the structure, uh, designed in 23-24, built between 24 and 25, it uh, opened, it was designed by Lewis Camper, who was a Bavarian-born architect who immigrated to the United States with his family and came to Detroit in the 1880s. He joined a firm of Scott and Scott and formed, formed and founded the firm of Scott, Camper and Scott. He did several different mansions in Indian Village, as well as the mausoleum at Roselawn Cemetery in Berkeley. And he basically did a lot of the structures around town that people know but don't know were his, such as the building we're on right now, the Carlton Plaza, the buildings that we've seen in the background, the Hotel Eddie Stone, and the Harbor Light building, which was originally called the Park Avenue Hotel. The book Cadillac was one of his most significant structures and accomplishments. When it opened, it had 1,200 rooms, had its own casino, had its own radio station, had its own telegraph department, and um, what else? It had its own Swedish bath, had its own sauna, it had four restaurants, so, and let's see, had one main ballroom and two smaller ballrooms. It was the place to be. It was home to five different presidents, uh, I was Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman when he came in uh, 1951 for the city's 250th anniversary celebration, John Kennedy, he stayed there twice, and President Ronald Reagan when he was Governor Reagan of California in 1980 for the uh, GOP National Convention. It also was where Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. met for the very first time. They were both in town doing performances at different places both staying at the hotel and they had heard of each other but they we were I have been told by employees of the hotel that they met there for the first time it was the place for athletes to stay Lou Gehrig stayed there Babe Ruth stayed there Lou Gehrig actually collapsed on the staircase in the grand lobby and then announced his retirement from baseball in the grand ballroom the book Cadillac Hotel is also filled with stories of the people who stayed there and their exploits. One of my favorite stories has to do with Mickey Mantle and his teammate Whitey Ford. The New York Yankees were in town for a game and staying at the book when they heard a rumor that another one of their teammates was in another room having a romantic encounter. In their inebriated condition, they thought it would be a good idea to crawl out onto the ledge so they could get a good look and maybe surprise them. Well, the problem is, their teammate closed the window and blinds. They eventually decided to go back, but then they discovered their next problem. In their intoxicated shape, neither of them was capable of either turning around or crawling backwards. So there you have it. Two of the greatest athletes ever to play the game of baseball, trapped on a hotel ledge, more than a dozen stories above the city streets. Eventually, they decided to crawl all the way around the building just so they could get back to their room. Uh, some of the other people of uh, notoriety that were here, the uh, film in 1948, State of the Union, starring Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, they both stayed here and they filmed sequences of that movie in the Grand Lobby. And the some people refer to it as the black exploitation film, Detroit 9000 there were scenes that were shot in the grand ballroom at the book Cadillac. And uh, some of the other notables that had stayed there, Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stayed there in 1962 when he had his march down Woodward. And then he had stayed there again in 1968, two weeks before his unfortunate assassination, uh, when he spoke at Gross Point High School, I believe it was Gross Point South High School. He gave a speech there and he stayed at the book Cadillac. And as I recall, Dr. King referred to the book Cadillac as a pearl in a sea of turmoil, which I think was very prophetic for the city at the time. 
The book Cadillac's Hotel's first six years were years of unprecedented success. The book brothers' dreams seemed to be coming true. But all of that came to an end with the onset of the Great Depression. By 1931, the hotel was forced into receivership. Over the next 53 years, the book Cadillac Hotel changed hands and names several times. It was renovated, altered, and redecorated each time. But with all of it, it still carried the same sense of grandeur and pride that the Book Brothers envisioned in 1917. All of this came to an end in 1984 when the last guest finally checked out of the Book Cadillac Hotel. Like so much in Detroit, though, what seems like an ending is really just another beginning in disguise. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, young folks, most of them in their teens and 20s, started exploring buildings like the book Cadillac. Photographs of her interior and stories of these urban explorers and their exploits soon began to fill the internet. Entering an abandoned building, often through an open window or door someone managed to pry open, is illegal, but they did it anyway. It gave them a sense of adventure, an escape from a sterile in suburban environment and perhaps more than anything else, a connection with their past. This exploration of the book Cadillac in many ways gave birth to a desire to restore it. The earliest efforts to bring attention to the book Cadillac and its potential for rebirth came from those with no political or financial stake in the building. People who had been inside, heard about it, or simply saw it from the outside as what it was. It's empty. It's decaying. That, uh, that's an anomaly in the world. There aren't many large, empty buildings like this, except in the most uh, unusual, uh, deteriorated economies. I think downtown has focused a lot, especially over the past, perhaps even 20 to 30 years, on putting on this image that everything is great. And so whenever a building was demolished, you know, if it was abandoned, it was demolished. We took down buildings that didn't, that didn't work for us. They were old, they were archaic. We couldn't use them anymore. I think that by making this significant investment in redeveloping a building, it shows uh, ambition. Ambition, the same type of ambition that was necessary to build such a large structure in the first place. I think a redeveloped book Cadillac would make a huge impact on the entire community. I think people will love to come down and walk into the, the lobby to stay here. It'll be the place to stay of choice of all the hotels. It will have an impact on the surrounding neighborhood and it will also have an impact on the city as well. It'll have an impact on the surrounding neighborhood because people will realize and see that this large, the largest derelict structure now in downtown has been redeveloped and is being reused. And people will realize that it doesn't matter how ugly a building looks, how beat down it appears, that it can be renovated, that it is possible. As an undeveloped building, it, it says that Detroit has not yet figured out how to handle its treasure trove of 1920s skyscrapers, which are huge potential for economic redevelopment. Congress and our Michigan legislature have provided huge incentives for redeveloping these. And the government has determined that cities are an important part of our, our national backbone. And the cities need help. And this is one of the unique ways that cities are able to be redeveloped through preserving and restoring um, the economic vitality through redeveloping and preserving their old buildings. As word of what the dormant book Cadillac Hotel was like inside began to spread, people, often too young to remember the, what the hotel was like when it was open, became involved. Uh, the Friends of the Book Cadillac is a nonprofit group. It's really a guerrilla group made up of people from all walks of life. Uh, we have a strong internet presence. That's primarily how the 300 or so members communicate. And we, we basically distribute information. We have members that study the buildings, just pulling in information, and we pool those resources and get it to the right people, and basically just make the public aware of the issues at hand and how important saving this building is 
and just raising awareness. I think that the more citizen input you have in a project, the more reflective of the population it is, obviously, and the better off for the city it is. And I think that the Friends of the Book Cadillac have made a big step in the right direction when it comes down to analyzing redevelopment projects such as the Book Cadillac, not only from a historical standpoint, because that is very important, but also from how it makes sense economically and how the city can benefit great between these, leveraging these two strengths. Once interest began to develop, there were a number of obstacles in the way. When the hotel closed its door, its owners wrote it off as a loss on their taxes. If the book Cadillac was sold, they would have been faced with a very large tax bill. As a result, they didn't really want to reopen the hotel. The case surrounding the book Cadillac Hotel lagged for years in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Chicago. The book Cadillac Hotel was closed in 1984, and, um, and its ownership was, was spread am among several investors. And between that period um, and today, uh, the city has tried um, various scenarios um, in terms of uh, reuse, in terms of thinking about um, selling it, getting clear title to it has been a big struggle. Um, and leading through the Archer administration through the, uh, the late 90s um, and into uh, 2000, um, title was cleared and the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation uh, did a tremendous job to um, spearhead the effort to clear title, see a path, and um, capitalize on a $500,000 um, study that was commissioned by um, the Kilpatrick administration um, at when they targeted it as a building to look at. Well, I think that the Book Cadillac Hotel is essentially the epitome of the rise and fall of Detroit. When the Book Cadillac opened, it was dubbed the, one of the greatest hotels in the entire world, so much so that um, one could get an, a life insurance policy for two days just for staying there. I believe that there will be a cascading effect with the redevelopment of the Book Cadillac in many different ways. Economically, there will just be more people in the area um, in, in a less tangible sort of way where the, the being able to take something that has fallen into such disrepair and bring it back to its original grandeur and beauty. Uh, that'll just create a sense of confidence and a sense of redevelop a, a rebirth, a spirit of rebirth in the city, which will I think will will be one of those one of those major projects which will which will evoke a sort of tipping point for the city of Detroit. And it'll just be I think it'll be a benchmark for the city's redevelopment and turnaround. There were attempts on and off to reopen the hotel, um, but the previous owners. Um, there's questions as to whether or not they were really serious about reopening it or if they were using it as a tax dodge um, to offset some of their other, other gains. So they let it sit and crumble and didn't do anything with it until around the year 2000, 2001, the city got, the, got control of the building through bankruptcy court. Um, the Book Cadillac has done an important part in focusing public attention on this building. They brought key resources to the Gensler Group, which was hired by the Detroit Downtown Development Authority. We met with Gensler very early and, and presented them three pieces of information. We gave them a beautiful book that David Corman had acquired through eBay which was actually produced by the book Cadillac and it showed the original floor plates, colors, and decorative motifs of the building in the 25s. We thought that would help Gensler develop a redevelopment plan inexpensively and accurately and they were very appreciative of that. We also provided them with the standard economic redevelopment tools that are available for all kinds of historic preservation. Now They said that they were aware of this already but we assured them that recent directors of economic development in the city of Detroit were not aware of them, so we didn't want to miss an opportunity to tout the economic advantages of historic redevelopment. And the third thing that we gave them was a little piece of plaster, which they were passing around the table. It was kind of funny. So we sat at this table, they passed it around, and we're playing with it. And finally we said, the, the third thing we want to talk to you about is that piece of plaster. It's got asbestos in it. And they dropped it like a hot potato. We said, this building is full of asbestos. 
And if you preserve it, all you have to do is paint the plaster and keep it in good shape and the asbestos remains encapsulated. However, if you demolish it like you did Hudson's, that asbestos will become freed up and will waft through the community, poisoning the lungs of the people that work and play and live in Detroit. And that would be against the law and you would have to remediate all the asbestos because it, it has to, the, the EPA requires it and that remediation would more than double the cost of demolition. Now Gensler said, well, we're, we're architects, we want to restore it. And we said, we know you're architects and we presume you want to restore it, but it's important to put in your report the fact that it does have asbestos in the plaster and if you do go to demolish it, you have to put that into the budget right at the beginning, not somewhere after the project has begun. So that way, what we had hoped to do by giving them the book we thought we would make it less expensive for them to redevelop it and make it more accurate. By talking about the economic incentives, we wanted to point out that the government does want it restored and there are tools. And by talking about the asbestos and the plaster, we wanted to point out that if they choose the other model to demolish it, it's going to cost them a lot more. And what we tried to do was tip the balance of economic development in favor of redevelopment and against demolition. And that's what the Friends of the Book Catholic tried to do right at the beginning, as well as focus attention on this great opportunity for all of us. Well, what we're looking at here is the keystone of the main arched entryway of the Carlton Plaza. Um, what we have here is a very unique and unusual keystone. From my own experience and own touring of the city, I have never on any building, not of Lewis Camper's design or of any other design, ever seen this style of keystone before. It's extraordinarily unique. As you just saw, it's very Central European type facial features. It's a very strange and unusual piece. What makes it even more strange, unusual, and unique is that this piece was actually stolen from the building. It was torn out, stripped out, and disappeared into oblivion, into urban oblivion, that is, never supposedly to be heard from again. Until we started this project and our owner was contacted by a gentleman, I'll refrain from using his name, contacted by a gentleman who lives in the university district that says he found the keystone at a flea market and that he knew that it was from the building and decided to buy it in hopes that one day it would be able to be reused. I refer to it, I've coined the phrase of this type of industry as gray market antiques. That is the sale of items that may or may not have been legally removed from buildings and 90% of the time they have been illegally torn out of buildings that the person who removed them had absolutely no legal title or claim to. They just felt, well, these people in Detroit have no idea what they have, so I'm gonna help myself and take these items and, structure, and structural elements. So what we end up having is a city who's having its identity stolen piece by piece as if the vandal sacking of Rome all of these little pieces, large pieces, stone pieces, people just help themselves to them because somehow they feel if the building's abandoned, they're entitled to salvage whatever they want, even though it's, it's totally illegal. So this type of thing continues to go on in the city of Detroit, and it's an ab absolute abomination. If a building's being demolished, that's one thing. Salvage what you can. This building was never scheduled for demolition. A lot of the buildings I've seen have never been scheduled for demolition, and yet somebody decides to help themselves because they think somehow they know better and that the people in Detroit don't appreciate what they have. So they're just going to take whatever they want, sell it however they wish, and somehow they can pocket the money, and these people sleep well at night. A lot of it has happened at the Book Cadillac, from copper details that were on the parapets on the roof to the bronze doorknobs that were on all the doors. 
people just got in there when they were liquidating it and bought all the china and silverware and, and furniture and things like that. But what they started to do without any kind of permission was, hey, this doorknob has got a crest of the Cadillac coat of arms on it. I'm going to just take it off. Who's going to know? How can you possibly justify liquidating a building and then just helping yourself to all the doorknobs, all the uh, scratch plates, the scutcheon plates, the light switch covers, the plaster detailing? It just amazes me to see the logic that these urban thieves use to strip these buildings out. You know, these urban vultures, architectural thievery, that they use this logic like they're somehow saving these structures and helping people out by taking them. I mean, it is completely perverted logic that they somehow are the good guy in this whole situation. I, I don't understand it. I have seen it off and on for almost nine years in this city, firsthand, seeing these buildings torn to pieces. And it never ceases to amaze me that people think that somehow they're the good guy and that the people who own these buildings are the bad guys. Finally, a compromise was reached. The original owners retained a 1% share of the hotel, just large enough to stave off a tax bill that they couldn't afford. With that out of the way, the hunt was on to find a developer. At first, a contract was signed with the subsidiary of Kimberly Clark. They, however, backed out of the deal after only a few months on the job. As far as working on the book Cadillac, I mean, it's a difficult project. It's made more difficult because the people that are in charge of redeveloping it uh, are tempted to um, pursue other agendas. So for instance, this job, there was a, a developer that uh, wanted to develop it, that was assigned to develop it, started the work and walked away from the project. And it's my understanding that they walked away from the project because uh, certain powers in the city wanted their cronies to be involved in the project and it was adding layers of expense to the redevelopment and uh, the developer hadn't functioned in all those layers of unnecessary expense when they designed the economic model for redevelopment. So we're discouraged because there's some setbacks and because uh, people are putting their hand out there and, and trying to grab a piece of the action and they're doing this in a fashion that's jeopardizing the entire project. And uh, the project is in jeopardy and our fingers are crossed. And, and that's the most discouraging thing, that all the forces aren't pulling together and, and pulling in one direction. But there's people that, for selfish uh, reasons, are trying to um, grab a piece of it and for their, own, for their own advantage. And that's jeopardizing this project and all the uh, uh, historic uh, preservation jobs in the city. Uh, last week I was standing on Monroe in front of the National Theater with a friend of mine and a woman came up and said, uh, she asked, are you going to tear this building down? And I responded to her, why would you want to tear down such a beautiful building? And uh, her response was, because it's old. Uh, the, the, region, the region has a mindset that if it's old, it needs to be torn down so that something new can be built. And we really lack any concrete uh, historical preservation mode. There's, there's no driving force uh, pushing for that. Its future was uncertain in, in the fall, and it was actually um, listed as one of downtown's uh, dirty dozen, if you will. Big, huge buildings like the book Cadillac. Um, that had been vacant for many years, that hadn't had um, investment. And the, the, the city decided that it would spend money to go through due diligence on, a, on, on the building and um, got Gensler, a world-renowned uh, architectural firm, uh, to go through a uh, reuse scenario, a three-phase reuse scenario, where they looked at the building structurally, they figured out that it was still sound, that there were some issues, um, they thought through how it might be um, reused and the types of uses, um, the, the types of um, uh, residential development that could take place. Um, and that happened 
through the next year after the Kilpatrick administration begun. Around the year 2000, 2001, the city got, the, got control of the building through bankruptcy court and launched into a process to see if the building was structurally sound and if it could be redeveloped at an affordable cost. The, the structural studies started early in 2002. Um, first with the visual ex inspection and then they took steel and concrete samples with it, sent those out to the lab and everything right now points to being structurally sound and they're putting together the refinancing package. The city tried very hard and even though the city, you know, people give the city shit for not taking care of some of their other properties or other properties in the area like the Broderick and Fine Arts and UA, buildings that have great potential to be redeveloped and either held by slumlords or the city themselves. The fact that the city has tried pretty hard to go out and take care of this building and they've gone through you know, all these you know, different proposals and they went through all the historic tax credits and they brought it to court, everything they needed to do. And it was brought up by or bought up by a huge company, Kimberly Clark, that was going to get ready to do it and make a big investment in the city. And for whatever reasons it was, they completely dropped out. And I think that shows a big thing about people's view of the city, uh, what they think investment in the city will turn out to be, what we're looking like in time for the Super Bowl. And I'm happy to see that Detroit's still going through. The city, whether it's because they've got, it's got Grand Holmes and Kilpatrick's face on it, and if Kilpatrick doesn't win the next election, will they still be working this hard? But I think for the area, it's an important catalyst, and I think it does represent the tipping point that people have been speaking about of the Renaissance for the past 20, 30 years. Well, I think it marks probably one of the most significant investments west of Woodward in downtown Detroit, probably within the last 10 years. And that has a huge impact when it comes down to both the Gateway Street of Michigan Avenue and the, the $10 million re construction project of Washington Boulevard. So it has a huge impact financially to the area. It also serves as a large catalyst for immediately surrounding properties in the area. When this building was built, when they shot um, State of the Union here um, in, the, in the 40s, um, the scene that you, sh that you see of downtown is one of um, health and vibrancy. People walking around, people shopping, people um, taking cabs around and, and enjoying all the city had to offer. Um, Right now, it's, uh, it's desolate, it's a wasteland, and um, the building was built with the spirit of um, a civic-minded orientation. So bringing the building back physically means bringing uh, health and retail back, residents back, um, bringing uh, a, a historic structure back online. And that segues to the second part, which is what it means psychologically to the city of Detroit and its citizens. And, Bringing something back that's been vacant for so long, that's seen such decline, that's really mirrored the, the, the city of Detroit and its own economic struggle, would be psychologically such a huge boost uh, for the citizens of the city of Detroit and for the city of Detroit. It would say to the world um, and to the region and to the city that Detroit is starting to figure it out, that it's, that it's, that it's coming back truly. And wrapping our arms around a project like this really cauterizes, in my mind, um, uh, uh, an interest, a renewed interest in Detroit as a concept. So both physically, an impact on the, the downtown, and emotionally in psychology, bringing the book Cadillac back um, from the brink is, is, is a no-brainer and would be wonderful. Well, I think the impact restoring the book Cadillac will have will be a great one. I believe a lot of people are tired of the sterility and the genericness of uh, suburbs. And a city that has a history offers so much more. There's something larger that you can look upon. Um, a lot of history took place on that spot. And when people think about it, I think they can become excited about the environment that they're in. While the book Cadillac Hotel is an important landmark, it's worth taking a moment to look at some of the other things that are happening nearby. As Detroit cleans itself up for the Super Bowl, a number of great things have emerged downtown. Campus Martius Park has been opened as a premier gathering place downtown. 
The lofts of Merchant Row opened, converting a series of abandoned buildings into some of the finest housing units in the Midwest. Just north of downtown, in the Brush Park District, there are several buildings that no one thought could possibly be restored, and yet that's what's happening. What we're looking at right now, as you can see in the camera, is the center of what was called the Brush Park District. It was a major hub for Victorian architecture, as you will see as he pans. The different styles, we're looking at a partial First Empire Italianate structure here, kind of Second Empire Italianate. That's that's being worked on right now. You can see some that have the standard Victorian curved turrets on them. And you can also see for every one that is occupied or being worked on, there are several that are still burned out. The structure that um, you have just seen that's being worked on by the carpenters was one of the single most famous derelict structures down here. That was burned at least 35 years ago and has set vacant and falling apart for all that time. And as you can see now, a new developer has come in, is developing that one and rebuilding it, and will do infill housing next to it, two units, two carriage house style units to the west and one carriage house to the east. Construction is underway on the new downtown family YMCA, a four-story, 100,000 square foot facility. Unfortunately, much still needs to be done. The book Cadillac's former arch rival, the Statler Hilton Hotel, in some ways the birthplace of the modern hotel management and the site where Harry Houdini died, is currently slated for demolition with no clear plans for what will happen to the site next, likely creating one more vacant lot where a landmark building once stood. The former Tuller Hotel was demolished in 1992. To this day, only a gravel parking lot has emerged in its location. The 2,000-seat United Artists Theater and its 14-story adjoining office tower, built in 1928, continues to sit empty and decaying with no clear plans for developing them. The 25-story J.L. Hudson's department store was demolished in 1998, also with no clear plans for redeveloping the site. An underground parking garage was built, along with the foundation for a new office tower, in hopes that this would entice someone to build on the site. Seven years later, nothing has been built. The support beams for the building never built serve as tombstones for a portion of Detroit's history. Built in 1901 as a residential hotel, the Madison Lennox was named one of America's 11 most endangered historic sites by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In 2004, Detroit's mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick, promised that if someone could produce the $20 million needed to restore it, he would approve the project. Since then, according to Crane's Detroit Business, a total of 47 developers have made offers to purchase the property, with one pledging $24 million for the project. In spite of that, the city intends to spend almost $1 million to demolish it for another parking lot. Since a fair number of historic landmarks become parking lots in Detroit, we thought it would be a good idea to put this in perspective. This is a view of the area from MapDetroit.com. The areas shown in red are retail stores. These are apartments, condos, and other residential developments. And these are parking facilities. It's immeasurable for us at this point. I mean, people go to Europe to see the old buildings and to experience that piece of history as best they can. In 100, 200, 300 years, whatever survives from this era and from you know the 1920s in Detroit is incredibly valuable. People nowadays that just have this attitude of consumption where we use it and we throw it away and we build something new. It's a relatively new phenomenon and people don't, they don't embrace the old way and, and it's important because we appreciate those things and people in the future will appreciate them just as much. We can't change our mindset and just 
throw away all that's here. It's, it's so important. We, we lost the old city hall. We lost uh, the Hudson's building. The, uh, the train station sits in a decaying state. Downtown has dozens of 1920s hotels that are simply uh, buildings, skyscrapers that sit empty and undeveloped. And I believe that this would make a huge impact and it would start a, a, a renaissance of, and it would be a model and a proof that you can redevelop an old building and use it uh, in this new century. They should be exploited as an asset of jazz era structures, the likes of which will never be seen again, and if they are demolished, will never be able to be reused. It is an unfortunate incident that they have come to pass the way they are, but moreover, they should be embraced as the gems that they, they are and that they should be. I know that Detroit was once a palace, and that palace has fallen into ruin. But I believe in my heart of hearts that this city will be a palace again. Right now, there's a concerted effort to get the Book Cadillac Hotel ready for Super Bowl 40. The city's downtown development authority is running the redevelopment effort. We thought about delaying this film, postponing it until the hotel was open for business again. But the thing is, this story is a lot bigger than just the hotel itself. It's about the people who have stayed here, worked here, and dreamt here over the past century. It's about our connection with them. Even more than that, it's about our link with the generations yet to come.